Well, welcome. I want to welcome you to our Massey uh, Ethics panel today. Uh, our topic, Great Expectations, Holding Leaders to a Higher Standard. As we begin, I want to welcome you on behalf of Massey College, and I'd like to share with you the land acknowledgement. Massey College is built on land where many Indigenous peoples have lived. It is on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee peoples. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward the land and the great privilege that we have to work on this land. I'm looking very much forward to this conversation, and I want to first just very quickly uh, uh, introduce our panel. Uh, our one panelist is, is Lloyd Posno, who's been an accountant and a former partner at Ernst & Young, uh, a former CFO of one of Canada's federal parties. Lloyd received the Order of Canada for his uh, uh, volunteer work, uh, director of the Trillium Hospital in Mississauga, worked with the Red Cross, national coordinator for the accounting, mentoring for Aboriginal youth, and work with United Ways. Our second panelist is Laura May Lindo, a doctor of philosophy degree in education, a former NDP MPP in Ontario. I was interested to note that during her time at Queen's Park, she introduced a private member's bill, the Racial Equality and Education Systems Act. Prior to her time as an MPP, she was Director of Diversity and Equality at Wilfrid Laurier University. She's currently uh, teaching at uh, Waterloo University. And our final panelist is Tom Axworthy. Tom and I actually co-coordinate these panels. Tom has served in many ways at the federal level, including Principal Secretary to Pierre Trudeau. He played a key role in the repatri repatriation of the Constitution and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. He's been a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School at Harvard, executive director of the Bronfman Foundation, Historica, president of Walter Gordon Foundation, and is currently the public policy chair at Massey. We, uh, about two years ago, had a panel, an ethics panel, uh, that focused specifically on political leaders uh, and the issue of guidelines and, and accountability. And I just want to note that one of our panelists that day was Mary Dawson. Mary was uh, uh, for many years the Federal Ethics Commissioner, and she passed away uh, recently, and I want to just uh, remember her uh, and note her incredible uh, level of commitment to public service. Holding leaders to a higher standard, whether they be political, business, community, religious, sports leaders, University presidents, uh, uh, we've seen uh, uh, some great debate uh, about a couple of American U.S. presidents of universities in recent weeks. Can we, what can we realistically expect of leaders? Can we expect more of them? You know that comment uh, uh, when there's some kind of a political question going on and somebody will say, well, you know, we expect uh, higher standards uh, from our leaders. I'm reminded of the Hebrew uh, prophet Daniel, uh, who has that wonderful image of, 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 uh, of empires and leaders uh, being like a statue. And the higher up the statue, the, the metal it's formed is, is, is hardened. But as it gets down to the bottom, to the feet, uh, he has that incredibly interesting metaphor that sometimes leaders and empires have feet of clay. Uh, there's a, a, a wonderful image that stayed with us throughout all of those centuries. I don't believe it's different in any other field, but in my experience as a religious leader, uh, there are certain boundaries uh, guiding behavior. Some of those are written, some of those are unwritten. When those boundaries are crossed, the result is often disappointment, uh, a sense of betrayal, which sometimes can lead to a loss of confidence in institution and in leader. In, in my work over the years, I've served some congregations where uh, they had that sense of betrayal by uh, earlier leadership. Uh, and I can just testify from my own experience that uh, it often took two to three years of hard, uh, focused work uh, to rebuild trust. And so I want to acknowledge as we have this conversation that uh, in when there's that failure, when there's those uh, uh, clay feet, so to speak, uh, there's a, a significantly high social cost. All kinds of questions come to mind, and I'm sure the panel is going to raise others. Is there a higher standard? What standards can we expect? Who makes the rules? The impact of changing views on expectations. 
in my field, for instance, I can remember a time when one of those standards was that a, a minister could not be divorced. Uh, in my tradition, uh, ministers can be married. Uh, and But that was a very high standard. They couldn't be divorced. Well, that's all changed. Uh, that's not an issue any longer. What about the issue of private versus public leaders? Well, I'm going to turn it over to our panel, and we're going to start with Lloyd, and I look forward to hearing uh, what all three of you have to say. Lloyd, please. Good. Thank you, Don, very much. I appreciate the opportunity to participate today. Ethics has been a big part of my role since I started practice over 60 years ago in the early 60s. In the mid-1980s, I moved full-time into a leadership role in forensic accounting. Mm -hmm. In this role, I was able to focus my professional practice on investigating, reporting, and sometimes testifying into alleged wrongdoings, criminal, regulatory, and civil in Canada and the United States. During this time, I played a key role in establishing a code of ethics, standards, and training for those wishing to practice as forensic accountants in what we in Canada today. I spent my final decade before I retired overseeing such issues in many regions around the world, North and South America, Europe, the Middle East, South Africa, Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. Outside of my work, I was also fortunate before and after retirement to undertake a role in the governance and development of many large and small nonprofit organizations. I assumed my first director's role in the 1960s and continue to serve in a minor way today in another organization. Other organizations, plural, I guess. These roles often involved addressing ethical issues. With this background, I quickly said yes when Tom invited me to participate today but I must give you a disclaimer. My thoughts and opinions are based entirely on my experience rather than academic research and studies. I hope this perspective isn't too narrow and, and hope that it will add to the dialogue. I understand the focus today is on holding leaders to a higher standard. The only thing about this question which really intrigues me is why it's a question in the first place. I'm going to lead off by addressing two issues. First, what is a leader? and their responsibilities, and second, what is a higher standard and how it's established. I define a leader as someone who has a vision for an organization or a group of people who is able, through their behavior, to help people align their collective direction to develop, execute, and renew their vision and the organization. There are two key concepts to this definition. First is to have a vision, and secondly, through their behavior, to motivate others to achieve and renew this vision. It is important to note that I'm stipulating both the need for a vision and the responsibility for execution, not of their own personal objectives, but that of the group. I've had the good fortune to work with many leaders in various cultures and endeavors. Whether your goal is ethical behavior or something else, I've yet to see a successful leader who does not lead by their own behavior. It's not just a matter of walking the talk, although that's really important, but the effect of the example of what and how they wish the group to achieve. At the end of the day, I believe you can't take people where they don't want to go. Whether it is by coercion and threats or flattery and bribery, to be successful in the long term, the group must be comfortable with and strongly support the vision. In my experience, Leaders will not be successful unless they exemplify in their own behavior the vision they seek. In simple words, they must lead by example, which means holding themselves to a higher standard. I'm mindful of my time and hence would now like to move to the second issue, that of standards. I find the question of ethics to be both a subjective and evolving one. I think a society's ethics are very much a function of the time and place they are defined. Regardless, there are accepted standards within each society, organization, or group that can usually be defined at any point in time. The extent and nature of the evolution depends on the culture and mindset of the group. For example, an orthodox society which design, defines itself in terms of conserving the status quo and revering the past will tend to evolve more slowly than a progressive society which focuses on applying underlying values to changing situations. I'm not saying one is better than the other, 
just that the identification of standards and will differ depending on which of these societies you're in and their state of progression over time. I believe that in any society or smaller group, there will be generally accepted standards of behavior at any point in time. Some of these will be defined into laws and some will be accepted conventions. Both are equally important. Whatever these standards are, I think a successful leader needs to exemplify them through their own behavior or risk failing to achieve their vision. To me, that means the leader must hold themselves responsible for setting the mark and leading by example through exhibiting a higher standard in whatever direction they plan to go. I believe it is fair and reasonable for society to hold leaders to this commitment. Don, I don't know how much time. Have I got time for one short example? Yep, by all means. Okay. Uh, a few years ago, I was fortunate enough to be working on a case in Prague. This was in the late 90s, just after the so-called Velvet Revolution. One of the counsel I'd retained in the local in the local Czech firm uh, told me after a break that she had been a judge in the former system. In the former system as a judge, they train as a judge right out of law school rather than as was appointed later in their career as we do. And they also carry the role of an investigating magistrate, which is very similar to what they do in Europe. But she had one big difference. Her expectation was that when she had finally investigated the case, checked the law and had everything ready in terms of, of the guilt question and also damages, she would call the political commentator and she had a particular person to re refer to, usually in Moscow, who at that time would apply her judgment, background and reasoning to the public good as they felt it existed within the country. And then she would give her decision based on his advice and recommendation. Now she was working in a new system where the judge was more or less independent. There was no political input and she was working pretty much by the kind of standards we follow today. Some people would find it abhorrent to think that a political person would have the final say in a judgment that's coming down and that our system is better. I think our system is much better. However, the fact that she was working in a system before which revered the public good and designated the party representative to be the person to define how the law should be applied in terms of the public good is a whole different set of standards than what she was in at the present time. And this to me represents two different standards and someone working under two different situations, but she still would have high standards under both. I just think that's a good example of the things I was talking about. Great, thank you. Laura May, please. Uh, thank you so much. And that was really interesting. I'm actually going to pick up on a couple threads um, uh, that we've just shared. But before I do that, I just need to acknowledge that I'm actually tuning in from my home in Kitchener. Uh, this land is held down, cared for, loved, and stewarded by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral people. And I'm on the Haldeman tract um, as I'm joining you. Um, and one of the things that I had been taught from some of the Indigenous leaders locally here was that uh, when when doing the land acknowledgement, part of my job um, as somebody who's committed to helping with the uh, the act of reconciliation here on this land is to reflect very seriously on um, the reality of that land acknowledgement and connecting it to the topic of conversation that I'm about to have. And so um, joining you to speak about uh, higher standards, ethical standards for leaders, mm -hmm. I find myself reflecting on what leadership means within Indigenous communities and for myself as a Black woman who has been in sort of mainstream uh, leadership roles as an elected official. I was uh, the MPP for Kitchener Center for five years um, and also in a leadership role uh, in the university now uh, coming back into the academic world. What I realized was that there are differences, similar thread to what was said before, um, but there are differences in the, the responsibilities that we believe leaders to have when you're coming from a community who has been marginalized or that has been marginalized by the system that you're now a leader within. And so my connection uh, to that land acknowledgement sort of situated me in a different space. And as I was thinking about uh, what that standard is and who defines that standard, I realized that sometimes there's an actual clash 
um, a community clash of expectations. Um, and so what does happen, for instance, uh, I can speak from my own experience as uh, somebody who was holding a mainstream leadership position, but an active member in the black community, what community needed from me was sometimes intention with what the expectations were for me to be holding that mainstream leadership position to begin with. And one of those big differences was that as a black woman in a leadership role um, from my community, I had to remain tethered to community. Many decisions could not be made by me as an individual, although within the mainstream space, um, the leadership role required me to make decisions based on my own judgment with an assumption that because I had won this election, for instance, um, the decision I made would be good for all of the people. But in a lot of uh, other communities, before you can actually, uh, in good conscience, make a decision in that leadership role, you must take it back to community and you have to get input from community. Some people would call that like an Afrocentric perspective for me as a, as a black woman, um, where community actually, their standards matter more than the standards that are sort of inherent within the system that you're working. Um, and so for that reason, when I think about whether or not uh, leaders should be held to a higher standard, from my perspective in, in that community space, there isn't actually a question. Um, the standard is different. The standard is including the need to take seriously the kinds of change that communities need and the reason that they sent you into that space in the first place. Um, but sometimes that in and of itself poses tensions because uh, in those spaces and especially in systems that um, have not necessarily worked well for a lot of the community groups uh, that I'm both a part of and in support of, um, I spend a lot of my time in that mainstream leadership role trying to explain that there was a different need on the ground and that um, there's a different standard on the ground and that there are different voices that have to be there. So just the fact that um, I have been trusted uh, or entrusted with uh, the power or the privilege to be able to be in that uh, leadership role, that standard that's being held is supposed to be the standard of my community as opposed to the standard of the system that I'm working in. Um, and I find that that complicates the conversation in some very interesting ways, especially when we think about um, ethics and what a system says that it wants to do uh, in, in a position of power and what the impact is of that same system. And so sometimes being at that table as somebody who's not typically at the table, um, those conversations happen um, in a variety of spaces. And so the whether or not it's realistic to hold those standards, again, becomes this clash of different starting points um, or different standpoints. Um, it's realistic to have those standards for marginalized communities who have elected people like me to be there specifically so that we can have those conversations. Those standards are extremely realistic. And in fact, Sometimes during the election period, you were told very clearly by elders what those standards are. Um, on the flip side, whether or not it's realistic uh, within those spaces, like I remember having conversations in a variety of leadership roles that I've held where um, leaders uh, dogged by uh, feedback that their leadership isn't necessarily doing the thing that they say it's to be doing and so community is upset with them. Um, we'll often have conversations, not always, but a little line here or there that says, but I'm human. And as a human, I, I can, I've made a mistake or as a human, I don't know how to hold this or, or, or. And so what I find also uh, needs to be brought into the mix is if we are going to hold in the mainstream vision, if we are going to hold leaders to a higher standard, then I think we also have to ensure that they have the support network around them to be the humans that they are holding 
the the weight of those higher standards and provide them with the support so they can do their work well. Um, what I have seen uh, it, far too often is that we are so enraged as community about what's happening within the system that we don't remember that these are individuals in the system and we make assumptions about the information that they should just automatically know and sometimes they don't know the things that we want them to know now as a black person entering into that role um, some of that was very clear to me and so i would be able to say something or talk to somebody about why what they were trying to do was flawed we were all technically the same type of leader in the same leadership role. Um, but the reality was that I was bringing something different to that table. And so the, the realistic nature of the higher standard I always found was complicated. Um, I can't expect people who have not lived in, in the kinds of situations that I've lived through to know what to do, but our systems assume that just because you are a leader, you know all of that information. So maybe in order for it to be uh, more feasible that the leadership uh, and the power of your leadership is used in, uh, is used well, is used in a way that does in fact support all communities, um, we also have to ensure that leaders take the time to get to know diverse communities that they are in fact, quote unquote, leading. Um, and that they find a way to lead with the communities as opposed to lead the communities. Um, so that's where my brain is at at the moment. I think that it's really, really um, important for us to recognize that it's, an, at least for me, it wasn't a choice about uh, some of these questions felt like they were like my choice as an individual, but it wasn't. It was the community who had chosen for me and what I am doing is sort of holding uh, with great care the gift of their trust in order to lead as best as I can. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I very much enjoyed the, uh, the previous uh, interventions and both have uh, talked about the personal experience and grappling with this issue. Um, I, I want to take a, a slightly uh, different, perhaps even more abstract, uh, first cut at this. And, and that is on the question, holding leaders to a higher standard. That has been our tradition throughout most of history until now. We've uh, had a major change in moral philosophy and how that applies to, uh, to leadership. So um, if, if we look uh, going back uh, centuries uh, to Confucian uh, ethics uh, or the Hebrew prophets um, or uh, Greek and Roman philosophy, uh, Aristotle and Plutarch and so on. Um, every one of those first uh, attempts to define morality put on the leaders high expectations around character and and virtue um, whatever the specific ethical norms of those historical societies as they applied it to their leaders um, as uh, as aristotle said that uh, happiness was activity of the soul in accordance with virtue we don't use virtue very much in our society anymore but that was the essential word uh, through most of history. So, so people had, and societies had at least those commentators who we read, the ancient commentators and philosophers, very high expectations around truthfulness in uh, uh, bravery, honor, uh, uh, treating others with uh, justice. Now, there were always slippages from those personal standards but the question of holding leaders of whom much is given and therefore much is expected uh, philosophers like uh, like uh, confucius and others thought that the the basis of society began with there being a well-defined sense of ethics and virtues within the leaders 
uh, both for how they conducted their affairs and the, the model that they gave to society. Lloyd, Lloyd mentioned that. So the, that has been the norm. Uh, and, and most societies, there were always outliers and people who didn't agree, but by and large, there were common moralities or common frameworks in each of those historical societies which melded uh, uh, individuals who were part of those polities uh, together. That, that was most of human history. That began to change, though, um, in, in, in ideas. Uh, in the Renaissance, uh, Machiavelli uh, made the point that amorality was better than virtue. Uh, the most successful leaders uh, were the most self-interested, as opposed to uh, virtuous, which which the church and others um, had taught. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, Nietzsche said that God is dead, and that in fact morality weakened leaders, following the lead of of uh, Machiavelli, uh, and uh, and made the case the the will to power. Uh, became his norm. And then in the 20th century, uh, we developed uh, postmodernism, which questioned every value, saying all of them were simply individual and mat matters of language. The existentialists who said that there uh, is no grounding in real morals, it is all uh, situational. So in the 20th century, th there was really the assault uh, on the very idea that there could be virtue or public morality. And, and what that has meant for our own age, um, and, it's, and it's reflected in our business, in society, in politics, in many other areas, um, that we've, we've had a tremendous movement from uh, we to me, uh, Jonathan Sachs, the chief rabbi of, of the United Kingdom, has made this point very well in his uh, podcast and his, uh, his books. But, but that is that most of those philosophies that I mentioned uh, had sharing or concern for the other as part of, the, as part of their framework. We have grown uh, almost totally preoccupied with the me and the self. And, uh, and that has been reflected in the way that rather than bringing uh, morality or ethics to the center of policy making or business decision making, we've tended to offload things to the market. So we let the market, the autonomous market, not only run our economy, but seep into our politics where uh, parties look at, at voters as consumers, not as citizens. Rather than looking at the public interest, electorates are sliced and diced into small little market segments with uh, marketing going out to them with very little concept for the public good of citizenship, which had marked most of our, uh, most of our politics. So uh, I'll end on this point, which is for most of our societies in human history, holding leaders to a higher standard was axiomatic. Uh, that was the definition. Whatever the particular philosophy, they certainly held their leaders to it with a focus on individual moralities around truth-telling and fairness and sharing. Uh, in our age, we have got away from that common morality. We've offloaded things to the market. And therefore, we, we, ha we don't have, Laura May just talked about it, very, we find it very difficult to get any common standards. And because there are a few common standards, there are no standards. And that lets the Trumps and the Boris Johnsons welter into an avalanche of lies and the internet spew its hate every day. Thank you. What, what I'm gonna do now at this point is I'm gonna give each of you maybe one, no more than two minutes uh, to perhaps add anything to the conversation so far, or perhaps to comment on something else uh, that's been said by one of the other people on the panel. So we'll stay in the same order. And so Lloyd, I'm going to put you on the spot first. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, two things. I'll make one brief comment on Laura May, 
Um, I had the pleasure and, and luck at one time to be working with uh, a national uh, uh, indigenous group out of Ottawa. Um, and I found it a big shock. Uh, Laura, they didn't just look for input. I was dealing with leaders, uh, indigenous leaders from every province and territory. They actually want a consensus. So before they would make a decision, the board that I was used to, if you had 13 people on the board and seven or eight of them said, well, let's go forward because it's in the interest of the group, you would go forward. In this case, even though we had 10 or 11 on the group, the chairman would say, well, we really don't have a consensus yet. And so they were just looking for input. They were looking for consensus and we deferred the issue until we obtained consensus. It was a frustrating delay from my background, but I found it very interesting to see the dynamic as it played out within the different perspectives of the people who were at the table teaching me a lot of things. And Tom, uh, I might refer back to you a little. Um, the, I guess the only difference I might have is, is whether or not this uh, personal um, focus of people today, society, that in itself is a form of morality. If their morality says that I'm not here for the group, I'm here for me, then that is a, that, that happens to be their morality. I may not agree with that as being the best morality, but it is, in fact, their morality. Um, and uh, there's a lot of issues with respect to how the market gets played out as well, uh, but I, I won't go into some of those. But I think there's been a lot written about uh, corporations and uh, empires that survive better when they follow more democratic open ideas than one that are closed. But I'll, I'll leave it at that for now and let someone else pitch in. Okay. Okay. Laura May, please. Um, thank you. I want to pick up on two things as well. So um, the notion of consensus, I always find so fascinating because again, it's a, it's a concrete example of where you see systems actually um, in tension, in complete tension. But what is interesting about it is that when you do see consensus, though it takes a longer time, people feel like they're part of the solution and that they are being heard in the bigger conversation. And so there's something to be learned from it um, that I think is really, really important, especially when we think about leaders and the standards that we hold them to. Um, because we're expecting so much from them, then it would be really, really important for us to think about uh, how we ensure that whatever decisions they make, people feel heard. And really strong leaders can actually make decisions that not everybody agrees with, um, but that people see, they trust them enough to know that they are being heard, even though a different, uh, a different decision is being made. And even with consensus, that does happen, where somebody might have been on one side of the argument, but then after all of this conversation, they sort of shift in the way that they're thinking about it. Which leads me to the second idea um, where I wanted to add something to that really, really important philosophical history of um, ethics and morality. Um, thank you for that, because I, I immediately thought about um, uh, black existentialists like Franz Fanon. He was a psychoanalyst and uh, an existential philosopher. And for him, one of the, the biggest lessons that we have uh, within that history is that the system can hold a standard really, really high. And because of who you are and how you present in the world, you are never able to attain that standard. Um, or I think about somebody like yeah. Charles W. Mills, who talks about there's the system that we all believe is happening on the surface, but underlying it uh, for, for Charles Mills is the racial contract, which is also the name of the book if you're looking for more reading to do. Um, <laughs> and this idea is that we aren't always honest about the contracts that we're entering into, and those include moral and ethical contracts, which also impact the type of leadership that we're expecting from folks. And so in our context, where we're in this multicultural nation, we sometimes believe that if we get an Indigenous person or a Black person or a queer person into this position of leadership, that the mere fact that we have opened a space for them at the table means that they will continue the same system without asking for change. And mm -hmm. their commitment to community is to say, no, no, my job is to disrupt the very system that you have brought me into. And then we all laugh and hold hands. That's, I wanna be positive. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Okay, Tom. Well, I, I would say that, that when, when I when I talked about 
the evolution of systems. Of course, they didn't stay the same. Uh, there would be differing frameworks for differing times. And so, therefore, you look at uh, that uh, Laura May uh, brought up and Lloyd as well, how, how these things change. And, and part of it is listening to other voices and taking into account other interests. That's the point uh, that has been brought up about uh, consensus. And uh, one of the... Uh, key elements, which uh, to mention one personal thing that I have been engaged in, is that in order to help that change come along, to redefine the new commonality, if we can do that, then you have to look at uh, the basis of many differing points of view. And are there things that are held in common? We, we, we can't agree on everything. But are there some big foundational principles that wherever you're coming from, uh, that you can agree upon. And that means that you have to listen respectfully and enter into debate and dialogue, but then try to find those elements uh, to construct your common home. And uh, in, in one organization, uh, the Interaction Council that I've been associated with over many years, uh, it brought together uh, many faith communities, many diverse communities, uh, several years spent in examining a host of traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, the different variants of it, and so on. And of course, tremendous differences, uh, many different ways to uh, define the, the divine and to worship. But what all those faiths and those philosophies and perspectives had in common was one element about responsibility, that we had rights, but we also had some obligations and we had duties uh, and uh, and that uh, the beginning of, uh, of respect and rights was a sense of our own sense of responsibilities as individuals, as parents, as citizens and so on. That whatever whatever perspective, there was a glimmer around responsibility which could unite all of, the, of those differing perspectives. So uh, the Interaction Council then produced a universal declaration of human responsibility as a companion to the universal declaration of human rights. It was a tremendously worthwhile exercise for all who engaged in it. And I think the same principle holds for university boards, corporate boards, parties, and others in bringing together a variety of perspectives, uh, acknowledging that there are differences but looking for those commonalities. And if you can find them, build on them. Okay, thank you. Uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes, I wanna come back actually to that question of, of basic elements uh, uh, and can we identify them? But first, let's kind of uh, imagine a little classroom exercise or a group exercise. Old school, got newsprint on the wall, and you put up a word, uh, and you invite people to uh, uh, use a word or two or a phrase or two uh, to, to define that word. And so uh, the word I'm going to put up on the wall is integrity. Uh, and Tom talked about virtue. Uh, could be the same. So I'm going to just put you on the spot. and Just a, a word or two or a phrase uh, if you were asked to try to define that word. I'm going to come back and go opposite. We'll start with you, Tom. Well, I, I would actually use the uh, use the the sentence that you defined for this seminar that that virtue or integrity is is living up to a higher standard. Uh, okay. It's as someone said earlier, it's uh, it's uh, walking the talk. So it's 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 living a life toward meaning. Thank you, Laura May. Um, I immediately thought care that when, when you operate from a place of integrity, there's such great care and love for community, um, that, that you are able to lead in a way that people trust. So between care and trust, those would be the two words I would put up on that board. Thank you. And Lloyd. Well, I probably add the word belief. I think that, uh, um, Integrity to me means being consistent with your belief and your and whatever your value and issues are, whether I may agree with them, whether I don't agree with them. If you're espousing them, I think 
you are only following a role of integrity if you actually believe in the truth, the vision, or the direction in which you're wishing to go. Many people try to do something because it's a consensus of other people or because society likes it or because whatever uh, focus group wants it, but they don't believe in it. And I think the real issue with integrity is one of belief. Okay, thank you. Well, um, let's, uh, let's try to uh, define that virtue or integrity a little bit and uh, uh, come back to that question that Tom was talking about in particular about, you know, are there basic kind of recognizable standards uh, that we can all kind of uh, gather ourselves around? So um, I'll come back uh, to, uh, to Tom. I'm going to let you start on that one. Well, I would, I would start, I think, with uh, two things. Uh, the first is truth telling. I mean, how can you have ethics uh, if, if, if you don't try to tell the truth that, that, that uh, you don't, uh, sometimes you are mistaken, but the deliberate attempt to give misinformation uh, and to uh, lead people um, astray, to me, it, it, it's really the beginning of, of uh, all ethical systems is to try to tell the truth as you uh, see it. And then the companion of that, though, then, is civility. That, that you tell the truth as you see it and you make your observations on it. Uh, it, it was uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan who said you can have many... Uh, uh, opinions, but w you you can't have alternative facts. I mean, people can interpret the factual base differently according to their values and systems, but deliberately uh, misconstruing what seems to be a, re a reality on the ground is, is the, really the, the beginning of perdition, I think. But then part of that then, since there can be differing interpretations, is civility, uh, reason debate. Uh, listening to the other voice um, and and that civility of, of opening up enough space to to hear differing uh, opinions boy that that is something that's being lost in our society with the shrieks of the internet and the extreme partisanship in our parliaments uh, boards being tone deaf of uh, bankers giving themselves large bonuses as they run their banks in, into the ground in 208. I mean, um, uh, that, that element of trying to reach those common foundations, you can't have it if you don't tell the truth as you see it, and you can't have it if you don't listen and understand others. Thank you. Laura May. So I'm hoping that I still have the thread of the, the question because my brain just started to go like, <laughs> I got excited. Um, so I think that there has to be in the, I would like to add, so the truth and the truth telling is so important. Like I, I 110% agree. And the recognition that those interpretations that might be differing are also other people's truths. Mm -hmm. And so there's the existence of multiple truths and we don't necessarily live in a system, um, the mainstream system in the Western world doesn't necessarily hold a space for multiple truths. They feel like there's one truth that everybody is seeking, which a lot of the, the philosophers have, have led us to believe and agree that there is this one truth that we're seeking and then everything else is just an opinion. And because opinion isn't taken as seriously, we disregard it. And so the other thing that I want to add to the list is a value for, um, a value for our humanity and a recognition um, that everybody, no matter what your circumstances, are deserving of that value and care. Um, because I think if we're operating as leaders and we're trying to operate with these higher standards that we're now trying to define, um, one of the things that often gets lost are the people who existed and exist on the margins. Um, we don't value them in the same way. And so their realities aren't even taken to consi into consideration when we're creating those standards. So the only other thing I would add that might be a little bit of a tangent is that um, I often think we have to operate from a place where we take 
most seriously centering of the most vulnerable. And if we, if we center their needs first and value them first, everybody else in the system is held with care and love and compassion. Um, but if we hold other people first, we tend to forget that those folks on the margins even exist. And so that notion of having a value for um, and believing that other people's um, take on, on their experiences are actually their truths and holding it as a truth um, might change the dynamic in the way that we define these standards. Lloyd. <laughs> Don, I apologize. I didn't write down your question to start with, but I've, I've been following Tom and Laura May's comments so well. Would you just rephrase the question for me before I... Before I... I was picking up on Tom's question uh, or point about whether there's a, a whether we can have some common ground, kind of a basic uh, common uh, acceptable understanding about uh, standards. Well, I think that any group of people, whether it's a large society or an organization, a company or a large charity or a small group of community people living in the neighborhood, uh, develops the standards and the code as to what it would, what it would be. Um, based on my bringing up and my background, um, truth is very important. Um, I don't think there are many different truths. I think there are different interpretations of certain facts. And I think anytime you look at any particular case where something has happened on the street and you talk to two different people, the facts might be the same, but there are certainly two different inter interpretations of that. So I think, I think that there is a, a need and I think there is an ability to develop a common set of standards for the group and the organization. But I think you could get quite different ones depending on the groups that you're talking about. And this could involve um, different interpretation of the facts. It's critical. I really get frustrated as Tom does with the people who deliberately distort the facts in order to justify the opinion in which they wish to go. Um, and I find that abhorrent and, I, and it really frustrates the heck out of me. But um, I think that it is possible for people to define a truth, define a fact, and come up to a set of values and systems that they judge based on that. And then, you know, developing consensus to move forward in those directions is something that, that a good leader is able to do. And I think is, is, is critical to that. Don, I don't know if that answers or if I just wandered all over. Thank you. Thank you. One of, one of the, one of the things that kind of has drifted around the edges uh, is that, uh, and, and Tom talked about it the most actually, uh, is that uh, it seems to us, although I'm not sure we're necessarily unique in, in our human history uh, at this moment that we, we think things are changing so much. Uh, I think uh, past generations and time saw those kinds of experiences too but it does seem to to, uh, to me certainly uh that uh, there's been a huge shift uh in in standards in, in what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable uh and so i'd be interested in just some comments about um how we how we monitor uh standards and in, in a shifting change uh and uh, and so in many, many ways i guess the bottom line i'm saying is is who makes up the rules uh you know and so uh, i'd be quite intrigued to just to follow up with that uh, that question and i'm going to throw it at you laura May. i was so used to always being in the middle okay yeah. here we go well you um, talked about a leader leader needing to mix things up <laughs> mixing things up um so I find that it, it's such an interesting situation. I feel like we're in a moment in history, um, following up on what Tom was saying, where uh, even the things that we used to just sort of take for granted, we're, we're shocked at how far the pendulum has swung. And so there used to be a time where somebody might um, hold a particular belief, uh, have a particular set of values, but quote unquote, no better than to say those out loud. And right now there's like this openness to say all the things, like I can say anything I want. And alongside that has now meant that there is a pitting of ethics and morality, whether it's group or individual against the notion of freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Um, and 
so as we've moved into that uh, that space, there we are literally grappling with who does make the rules because there was a time where we assumed that the rules were made through a, a elected political offices because there was a social contract in which we all shook hands figuratively and decided that those those folks would through law, for instance, determine um, how far our individual rights went and the centering would be of, uh, of community and whatever we were, the nation building. And now there's a troubling of that. And what is also happening is that some folks who had been troubled by the, the rules of the game to begin with around ethics and morality and the, those standards are saying, but we've been telling you these systems haven't been working. And so um, I'm finding the whole, I don't really have an answer. I'm just saying that I'm finding the whole conversation interesting because there are now more people who are taking part in trying to figure out how to draw those boundaries. Um, and I don't think that you can have that conversation without recognizing that um, the speed with which technology is, is mediating our conversations uh, mm -hmm. is making it even more complicated because now it isn't just in your, you know, at home at the dinner table, somebody said something and now you're in the real world and whatever, the real world is, the dinner table is sort of following you everywhere you go. Um, and mm. there are real, real questions. And I think a real need for us to come together as a collective um, to make some decisions about where uh, that human rights bar, that ethic of care um, mm. can lead us to, uh, to think about our sense of morality and who we wanna be and become uh, in the future. Thank you. Lloyd. Well, um, I agree we've had a change. I, one thing we should remember is there's been a lot of positive change. Um, for example, um, the idea of medically assisted death uh, would have been, you know, a non-starter in the 1950s. Um, that when I grew up, uh, I caused my mother almost a heart attack when I dated a Catholic girl because uh, the Protestants and Catholics didn't date each other, um, <laughs> let alone black and white. Um, today, um, interreligious groups, interracial groups uh, have got a freedom, um, you freedoms with respect to how you define your own sexuality and your partners and those. They, there's been a widespread acceptance of um, a change in that morality, which just didn't exist uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when I was 70 years ago when I was growing up. And so I think those are very positive changes in my view. Now, there's a whole lot of people out there who think those are negative changes and they're using what, in my view, is scurious methods to try to defeat that change. So you've got you've got two uh, opposites going on, I think, between people who are progressively changing in one direction and others changing trying to resist those change and using methods that I don't think are appropriate and moral, if you want to use that term, uh, to resist those changes. And Laura May, I, I get, I was a little concerned about one thing you said that people are free to say what they want. People say what they want, but right now I can think of several presidents of universities who wouldn't want to say what they want, or some professors who wouldn't say what they want, or students who can't say what they want. Um, some of those things they're saying may be abhorrent to us, some of those things uh, perhaps are being misconstrued uh, by people and exaggerated in terms of what's going on. And so the same is true of, of comments with respect to racial interests, whether it's black or, or indigenous or others, uh, people are being accused of, of racial interests and, and you can be um, canceled, blocked and ridiculed, lose your career, your livelihood and, and everything just by making an offhand comment. So most people today are being I think more careful of what they would say than what they were before, because right now it's a very dangerous time to speak your mind. If you speak your mind today, um, there is no there is no privacy, and uh, and the vilification that comes out without people even taking the time to understand and hear what you did say and what you meant that that scares the, the, the heck out of me. Don, I'll let you care. Yeah, Tom. Well, I think. Uh, uh, Lloyd uh, did a good um, uh, turn for the group by by the discussion by bringing up that it is it is not all bad news and and I think uh, we have to keep that in in, in mind um, that that w with all our difficulties and and I'm going to turn to one in a moment 
Um, we have to begin, though. There are still millions of people doing their best to come together to try and improve their societies. I'm, I'm, I'm from Winnipeg. Uh, we uh, we have the Bear Clan that goes out at 27 below nights to find uh, if there are homeless on the streets to help them in terms of freezing or indigenous uh, needs. Um, in the UK, there was recently a, a man, uh, I think he's now passed, but at his 100th birthday, he said he would walk his garden uh, to raise uh, money mm -hmm. Uh, for veterans, he would walk his garden, and he hoped to raise three thousand pounds, and he ended up raising millions because he was doing his bit uh, as as a hundred year old to try and help his society. So we 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 can be hopeful. The, the our, our human species has, has got m many many uh, deficiencies in terms of ambition and violence, but we also have a a spirit for love and, uh, and and caring, and we can never forget that. But when you talk about the major changes, Don, um, when we look at, at, at world history, there, there's a virtual consensus that the invention of the printing press brought in the Reformation and just changed things enormously in terms of literacy and so on. It was one of those foundational changes. Well, we're in one too with the internet. I mean, that, that's as influential, um, perhaps more so than the printing press. Uh, and when, when you said, who is creating the standards on the internet, there are no standards. Uh, it, is, it is a free for all. It depends who you go to. Uh, there are no adjudicators. Uh, you can look for uh, adjudicators who you respect, but there are uh, people uh, who have no standards and there are foreign governments manipulating the internet. I mean, it's it's open to manipulation by those who would do us ill. So uh, one of our great, great issues, if we're going to have, as I talked about earlier, truth telling, trust, civility, what are we going to do about this tr revolutionary technology, which is changed everything about us it it's like the fifth horseman of the apocalypse right now and someone's got to rein it in <laughs> well thank you i uh, uh i've been really intrigued by the conversation i uh, you know so many threads are kind of running through my mind uh, the uh, uh the concept that there seemed to be a time in the past where you know, we, we knew more clearly or more recognizably uh, that the standards. I mean, growing up, I clearly knew what the standards were. Uh, my mother told me what they were. Uh, and uh, but we we are we've shifted, and we're we're living uh, in you know what some historians like to speak of as a crack in human history. Uh, and there's been really very uh, significant changes. And uh, I'm really intrigued by the concept of, of consultation with community uh, and, and how we go about that. That's a, an interesting reminder to me, actually, that our leaders uh, are leaders because they come from community. Uh, and uh, that's a very interesting kind of concept and, and, and a hopeful one. I want to thank you all. It's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the time you've given us today. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll, we'll say goodbye to our audience. Thank you. All the best. Take care. Stay warm, Bye. everyone. <laughs> <laughs>